For our July edition of Eye on the Arts, we explore arts and counterculture. Few arts capture the spirit of counterculture like graffiti, a medium embraced as art by some and discounted as vandalism by others. Felix Maldonado's path as an artist has put him in the alleys and train yards where the graffiti movement first popped up, as well as the corporate world of advertising. As the proprietor of Flex Creative Services, he finds himself drawing from his early experiences to offer everything from unique commercial designs to socially conscious street art. The gents at Black Devil Tattoo share their passion for the art, the camaraderie of their culture, and discuss the changing perception of tattoos. In launching their new shop, they strive to offer a unique experience where talented artists can connect to their clientele. We continue our look at the arts as a viable economic engine as I sit down with Erica Hanner. As executive director of the Lebesnik Center for the Arts, Erica has a unique perspective on Michigan City as a community promoting a future of create, play, repeat. Eye on the Arts is made possible in part by South Shore Arts, the Indiana Arts Commission, and the National Endowment for the Arts, a federal agency. Lakeshore Public Television and South Shore Arts are taking Eye on the Arts out of the studio and into the community. The show will take an intimate look at local artists and their creations, as well as galleries, theater groups, musicians, and performers, highlighting anything and everything that the diverse local art scene has to offer. Lakeshore Public Television and South Shore Arts feel the art community is a fascinating representation of Northwest Indiana, and we'd like to share that experience with you. In the 1980s, rail cars rolling in from the east brought a message to the train yards of East Chicago. Tags and murals of New York and Philadelphia graffiti artists caught the eye of a young Felix Maldonado and captured his imagination. Developing into a multidisciplined artist, including commercial marketing, video production, and public murals with a social conscience, he seems always to come back to the aerosol can. When I was five years old, I started painting, coloring books, drawing anywhere, and uh, getting in trouble for it. I was an artist, of course, before the graffiti art movement came around, which is good for me because I, I learned a lot of the basics of art. Once the graffiti movement came around, I just found it very uh, exciting, inspirational, uh, and something new. As a kid, you know, we used to go into the marshes and the prairies and build clubhouses and go fishing. So we had to cross tracks and get in there to go uh, do all that. And in, in doing so, we, uh, I started seeing some of these uh, uh, tags and then what became elaborate names painted on the trains, which got me thinking what's going on. Obviously, it was coming from the East, from New York, from Philly. That's how my interest and my passion in, in that sense of work came about. Aside from just doing portraits and landscapes, that was something unique and different and new. And uh, again, it was, uh, well, illegal, which made it a little more exciting as a kid, of course. Being called Felix by day and Flex by night, uh, makes it kind of cool. That's probably where it all started. I went to college at the American Academy of Art and I graduated with a bachelor's degree in uh, advertising and graphic design. And from there uh, I got picked up by uh, an ad agency by the name of Grant Jacoby as an intern. Went up the ladder to become an art director, produced a couple commercials, and a lot of print work, radio, uh, which was very fun. At one point, I was running around with the latest clothes. You know, I had a nice condo in the city with my girlfriend, and you know, I had the nice car. And 9/11 hit. So, with a lot of companies, uh, unfortunately, this company folded as well. So that left me basically in a state of like shock because I felt I was already set in my way and uh, planning to retire with what I'm doing. And, 
honestly, I think I pretty much forgot art. You know, in some weird way, it kind of kind of helped me getting laid off and finding myself again and saying, okay, what are you going to do now? It stripped me back down to who I really was. And that from there, uh, I opened up my own business. It really transformed me in a way that I, after everything was said and done in a dust settle, I said, what, what are you doing, Flex? That's not you. You know, this is not you. This is not... This is not you. So it, it helped me. It helped me basically get in touch with myself again and say, okay, man, don't ever let this happen to you anymore. Use your talents, utilize them wisely, and, and go for it. my age, and I'm just speaking personally, uh, at my age, I think I have something more that I need to offer. I think I have an obligation as an artist, as a community artist, to start implementing a little bit more social messages, or at least give a reflection of our surroundings through my work, as opposed to uh, just doing graffiti. In the case of murals and outdoor work, I'm very conscious that people will be watching, which is why, I, again, I choose my battles wisely and I, I choose the spaces that are going to be, where I'm going to be painting with care and time. As I moved in and I settled in a couple years ago, I had to get an understanding of who was around me uh, because I was going to do this mural. Being a new neighbor in town, I didn't want to ruffle any feathers or rattle any cages. So I wanted to make sure that uh, whatever I put up would be aesthetically pleasing, at least, you know. Uh, I started uh, primary my wall, and in doing so, um, this car pulled up and this gentleman jumped out. He says, I'm the director for a uh, battered women's shelter. I really would like to put something positive so that they can wake up to something positive every day. I saw this gate as a cage and I figured, wow, that'd be kind of cool because I have these butterflies already and I could incorporate that into my mural so it becomes sort of a 3D deal. So when the doors are open and the cage is open, it looks like these butterflies are coming out. That's Saturday. I finished the painting. I came on Sunday to do some touch-ups to it. As I'm on the ladder in the morning, I'm finishing up and I'm, like, I'm all sunburned from the day before. I'm tired, you know, long day. I'm painting it and uh, I hear in the distance, I hear a bunch of clapping. And I'm like, what's going on? So I, I turn around, and there's about 12, 13 women waving hi to me. There is no doubt that the perception of tattoos has changed in recent years. The gents at Black Devil Tattoo give us their take on being a part of a counterculture that has become more accepted by the mainstream. In talking with these talented artists, it quickly became clear that their passion runs deeper than the initial childhood excitement and taboo of the forbidden art. As business owners and talented artists, they embrace the history of their craft and, more importantly, the camaraderie of the tattooing experience. When I was really young, I stumbled upon a milk crate full of Easy Rider magazines, old tattoo magazines that were in black and gray. And I flipped through these magazines and I start drawing the icons that I saw in there. The skulls, the eyes, the flaming dice, things among that nature. I remember my mother getting really mad at me for having these magazines. I knew I was onto something then when I couldn't have it at that age. There was no, um, the apprenticeship was very open for me. It was very kind of take it as you can kind of idea. Basically the apprenticeship was, here's a pencil, this is how you keep it sharp, here's your eraser, but whatever comes out of this pencil is completely up to you. Uh, so for myself it was a lot of self-teaching, uh, trial and error unfortunately, 
But when you're young and you have friends who are young uh, and don't have money or are underage, they don't care, they just want tattoos. It was so hard to get into. Tattooing is something that's very hard to get into. Like nobody, nobody truly wants to teach you in this commission-based job how to do your job. Um, it's, it's absolutely commission-based. I do three series of drawings, or three, pr like, three primary sketches first. Mild, wild, and completely out of control. And then we start to differentiate what we like and we don't like from each one. So you kind of come in with like a, a broad idea, and I'll start throwing darts until we get closer to your idea of what you actually want. Um, when you choose to get words and quotes and poems, you open yourself up to misspellings, grammar errors, and things like that. Especially when you're taking from a Bible, which is a very old language that does not use everyday grammar, or a music lyric which is designed as a poem, which once again will not have correct grammar. If somebody doesn't understand that scripture or that music lyric and you go out in public, it looks like a mistake to them. I always like to say you can't misspell a portrait of an eagle. You know, 10 years ago, I would have been more of a, a weirdo, uh, someone that you would have seen and you would have been like, wow, look at that guy. Now, nothing but a spit in the wind. My bank ladies have tattoos, my nurses have tattoos, the doctors have tattoos. It's a very common bond once you realize what people have on them. And you're able to use it as an icebreaker to find a common bond between each other. It's not so much of a travel badge. It's not so much of something that kind of makes you stand out anymore. You know, doing this for the last 13, 14 years, it's more of a thing where I, sometimes I have to tell people to get up and take a look before they put it on their social media website or send it off to their friends in a text message. And, and it's like, dude, this isn't what it's about. Get up, look at it, see what I just did on you and you're gonna keep forever. You know, they're gonna last longer than you're gonna last because when I'm, you know, in the casket, I'm still gonna have them. I'm not gonna be here, but I'll still have them. There are plenty of towns who don't want a tattoo shop in their town. Uh, they have for whatever idea in their mind of maybe what we do here or what kind of people we're bringing. Um, so there were some towns that we approached uh, that just said no. So there were a lot of challenges with some towns. Uh, Lowell, on the, on the other hand, was very, very warm and inviting. We wanted to be local with the community and the Lowell mascot is the Red Devil. So we chose a name that was a little bit offbeat, a little bit Black Devil. Black is the carbon of life. Black is something you need in tattoos. You need your heavy blacks, you need your high contrast. And we use the word devil as a form of rebellion, as a form of a little bit of a taboo. And it worked well with the town, and the town really liked it. Well, we worked together, I worked with them for the last seven years. And when we were working together, we just really didn't like the way that things were kind of turning out. Uh, it was kind of basing more on getting them in and getting them out, okay? Which is the old school mentality of get them in, get them out, get their money. That's not really what we wanted to do. We wanted to create something to where you could walk in and everybody would say hi to you. You know, we wanted to create something where you could walk in and hang out and idea shop, you know, look around, try to gather ideas. We have idea books. We want to be a part of your life. Um, I generally run appointments three, four months in advance, if not longer. I got people that'll wait that, you know, three months for a 20-minute tattoo. So by opening this up, it gives us a lot more time to spend with people and to get to know them to make a better tattoo decision for them. And, you know, we're just all out just trying to have a good time. So, yes, it's a business. Yes, it's professional. But, hey, man, it's a it's, it's clubhouse. You know, we wanted to have our own clubhouse. A big thing for us was not having any walls. If you look in here, there's no walls. We really didn't want any of that because that creates a barrier. So I could be tattooing a street thug and Dave could be tattooing a county sheriff and Luke could be tattooing a soccer mom. And we'd all be having the same conversation and chiming in on each other's conversations. And you know, my guy would get up and look at what this person's getting and this person would look at what they're getting. And then you know, it's like a treaty 
when you walk in the door. It's like, you know, there's, there's no judgments when you walk inside of Black Devil. Black Devil's for everybody, and that's what we really wanted to create. The inspiring parts about being a tattoo artist is the connections you make with humans. It's how you interact with them on more than just a picture on their skin. You become in tune with them and you understand them the more years that you tattoo them. You become part of their family. The ideas of growing old with a client has been amazing. After 10 years plus of tattooing people, I've, I've seen them mature over the years. And I've seen their taste of, of tattoos mature. You get to create something that is literally on someone forever. Uh, so the, the customers that are willing to trust you enough to give you that freedom to design their stuff and then do it, I mean for lack of better words, it's pretty rad. Uh, and then for the amount of years I've been doing it and having built up a large customer base, like it, I think that keeps me going too. Just knowing that I've been, been able to go as long as I have, that they themselves allow it to, to keep happening. So, If you like it, you can do it, dude. If you put your heart and soul into it, you'll get it. You know what I mean? And I try to install that in my kids now. You know, I have a 10 and 11 year old and you know, they're trying to find their way. We were all young once, but I tell them, you know, if you want something and you're good at it and you really love it and maybe you're not the best at it, but if you do it every single day, you're gonna get good at it. And if you're passionate about it and you think about it all the time and you study it and everything is evolved around that one thing, dude, something good is gonna happen. And I couldn't be a happier guy. You know, people ask me all the time how I'm doing. Top of the world, dude. Find Black Devil Tattoo on Facebook for more examples of their work. Looking to Michigan City, we continue our ongoing look at art as a viable economic engine. Known for its recreational opportunities due in large part to its shoreline, Michigan City is embracing creation as part of recreation, community, and economy. Erica Hanner, Executive Director of the Lebesnik Center for the Arts, brings insight to Michigan City's promotion of itself as a place to create, play, repeat. I'm here today at the Lebesnik Center for the Arts in Michigan City with their Executive Director, Erica Hanner. Erica, lovely to be able to have this opportunity to chat with you about um, the wonderful things, the redevelopment of downtown Michigan City, specifically the Franklin Street Corridor through the arts, which was largely led by the Lebesnik Center over the past, what, how many years? 10 or so years. Yeah, I thought it had been that long. Now you have been here for a year and a half. That's right. And you previously worked at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. So what, uh, I know you know all of these things. How did this come about? How did, did it start with the first Friday Art Walks? It did start with the first Friday Art Walks. The Lubeznik Center, and of course, this was long before I got here, but mm -hmm. the Lubeznik Center for the Arts was one of the founding members, the art anchor organization mm -hmm. that started what is now a really vibrant um, once a month after work sort of stroll through the galleries and retail mm -hmm. of Franklin Street. Um, it's booming. It's, it's something that we're well known for in the, in the area, and we hope it just gets bigger and bigger. And is it a year-round thing that the first Fridays are equally popular in the wintertime as they are in the summertime? They are um, popular year-round. Year of course, mm -hmm. the population swells in the sure. summer. So yeah. yes, the, the attendance at first Fridays does grow a bit in the summertime. Yeah. But we're proud of the fact that we know we're open 12 months a year. Yeah, and the people who are here for the weekend or for a week or two at a time are dying for something like this to do. Absolutely, yeah. you know, there's only so much time you can spend on the beach, and, and right. there, we do get the occasional rainy day, it is yeah. true, yeah. and it's a wonderful way to meet other people and to really get to know what's going on in the town that, you know, is, is um, growing and by leaps and bounds. Yeah. So Franklin Street had become a pedestrian mall at one time, back like in the 60s when I was little, I kind of remember that, and, and it kind of killed it. Yeah. And yeah. that was because Market, Market Mall had, had, had opened on 20. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, it's fascinating the way sort of cultural and retail mm -hmm. and city planning sort of ebbs and flows and changes. You know, that pedestrian only um, 
model was all the rage for a it while, was. and it came out of a European model. Um, and in many cases, and others would know better than I exactly, you know, what the per perfect ingredients are for a successful pedestrian way. But whatever they were, we were missing an ingredient yeah. or two. At what point did the city recognize that this was the right thing to do, and to let's 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 uh, capitalize on this and put our resources into it. You know, I think that was under Mayor Oberly, the, the Mayor Mears um, predecessor, mm -hmm. um, and they've both been huge champions of the arts. Um, but to sort of identify um, something that seems to be happening somewhat naturally and mm -hmm. to s start to invest in it mm -hmm. and to systematize it and still let it be as quirky and sort of organic as it ever was, mm -hmm. but give it the love and support and city um, sort of blessing that it needs to help it um, get even to, to sustain itself. And, and this is something that the city planners are behind and takes, they take it very seriously. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, so Michigan City now has just undergone a rebranding process mm -hmm. and the mantra that's been adopted for Michigan City is create, play, repeat. Mm. And so everybody, all of us in the arts are thrilled. Mm -hmm. um, but that is exactly what is, is my case in point. So they identified what was already occurring here naturally mm -hmm. and said, this is what Michigan City is about. Let's invest in it. Let's, let's name it and mm -hmm. let's grow it. How many, how many galleries do you have on Franklin Street, would you say? Oh gosh, there's at least half a dozen. Really? And they're changing all the time. You know, oh, that's Blink fantastic. has been an anchor sort of on the, the far side for uh -huh. a long time, and there's a few new ones that have just cropped up um, in this season. And there are other kinds of retail as well. Absolutely. It's attracted like that cute shoe store. <laughs> Absolutely. Urban it, Souls. Urban Souls. Yeah, everybody I love loves that Urban store. Souls yeah. and all the we have a you know, we're also sort of equally known for our consignment shop. So if you're sort of a thrift shore store sort of person, um, Franklin Street Street's got I've quite been, a lot. Oh, there's a, there's more than one. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so now it's called the Uptown Arts District, and there are twinkly lights at night. <laughs> yes. Right. There are twinkly <laughs> lights. <laughs> and there I've are seen... banners, and there's a logo, and yeah. And and it's busy all all week long. Not yeah. just on the first Friday. Yeah, that's important to us because anytime somebody comes down to Franklin Street, mm -hmm. we need to be open for business and be showing ourselves at our best. Right. Um, and so everyone's got their open flags out. We have one out in front as well, mm -hmm. that we're all open for business. And that's, so one of the really big components of the of the Uptown Arts District is the Uptown Artists Lofts. That's what you call it, right? That's what it's called. And it was in it's in the old Warren Building that's from the twenties. So how did that come about? Again, Lebesnik took a lead role in, yeah. in bringing that to Michigan City. That's right, so someone, and again, this was my predecessor here at the Lebesnik Center, Carolyn Saxton, mm -hmm. really identifying the potential of, of that opportunity and what it could mean for Michigan City. And so she was the champion on this end in terms of the, um, um, the site committee mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing to bring attention to Michigan City and champion our petition to get the ball rolling to bring the art space lofts here. And it took a number of years for, right, for this thing to develop. It did, it did. I mean, there's the whole component of finding the right property and, and procuring that property and leveraging the finances. It's no small, small feat to take a building that's been here since 1920s and repurpose it for yeah. you know 21st century loft spaces. So the artists live there. They have, Do they have like an exhibition space on the main floor? I'm, I'm ashamed to say I haven't been there yet. <laughs> You'll have to get over there. There's, there's some retail spaces okay. on the main floor and an exhibition space as well. Our region is really appealing to young emerging artists from Chicago who can't afford to live, even like Bridgeport was a, a refuge for them at one time, but yep. now that's too expensive too. Right, Pilsen, Bridgeport. Pil yeah, so now they are discovering Gary and Miller. There are young artists there. So it's great to see that our urban centers, and Michigan City is a pretty urban community, mm -hmm. although it is also a beach, a beach community. Right, it's got the best of both worlds. Yeah, yeah. So it's great that in Michigan City is benefiting from that so much. Yeah, artists tend to lead the way in redevelopment. You know, they're Always. looking for large affordable spaces to work mm -hmm. and you can find large affordable spaces in places that are sometimes in sort of on the upswing yeah. um, in terms of their economic viability. And plus which, it's nice out here. There's there's a viable working community here mm -hmm. and there's so much natural recreation, you know, with, with kayaking and the beach and um, hiking and all those sorts of things. And if you don't want to go outdoors, you can come to the art galleries well, Erica, thank you so much for, for uh, chatting with me today about uh, the transformation of Michigan City through the arts. I'm happy to. It's a Thanks, subject John. that I'm, I'm happy to talk about myself and, and to promote. Thank you. So thank you.